We want simple explanations. That's Richard Sim Simmons' point. Yeah. We want a simple explanation, and I'm saying God cannot possibly be a simple explanation. He's a very complex explanation. It's not really whether you're going to get a simple or a complex answer. It's whether there's something really striking and different from all that we know at the bottom of the chain that I think is most interesting. It's not possible to have a scientific explanation which is very simple simply because it consists of explaining in terms of laws and laws involve a lot of things doing the same thing and that's just not a simple starting point. A complete explanation would of course involve the ongoing efforts of uh, well, in this case, I suppose physics and cosmology um, to figure out what can be said about the very first moments of the existence of our universe. Hello and welcome to Unbelievable, the show that aims to get Christians and non-Christians thinking about the topics that matter to all of us. I'm Ruth Jackson and on today's Unbelievable, we return to a fascinating discussion recorded earlier this summer. We have teamed up with our friends at the Pan Psychast Philosophy Podcast for an event that they hosted in London recently. If you want more from Premier Unbelievable, please do like today's video and subscribe to the channel. You can also visit premierunbelievable.com. And please do also check out the Pan Psychast YouTube channel and podcast because they have got lots of great conversations there. In part two of this event, The Mystery of Existence, we will explore some really important questions. Where did natural environments and complex organisms come from? And what is the origin of life more generally? We're going to be hearing from four of the biggest names in philosophy. Richard Dawkins, representing science and atheism. Jessica Frazier on Hinduism. Sylvia Jonas, speaking on Jewish philosophy. And Richard Swinburne, defending Christianity. They are being moderated by pan psychast host Jack Symes. So let's join their conversation. I'm kind of interested in the way that everyone is suggesting different kinds of explanations for what the whole of existence, and of course our title is The Mystery of Existence, what kind of explanations we would want. And I kind of want to ask each of us, from a philosophical, a scientific, uh, a Christian theistic perspective, what kind of thing would a complete explanation look like right, for, from each of these perspectives? So from a philosophical perspective, if we had the whole explanation, what kind of thing could that be? Well, as I said in the beginning, I think a, a complete explanation would, of course, involve the ongoing efforts of, uh, well, in this case, I suppose, physics and cosmology um, to figure out what can be said about the very first moments of the existence of our universe. But at the same time, I think from... Uh, from a slightly different point of view, perhaps from a religious point of view, we should ask the question, what's the purpose of everything? And really listen to what different traditions and religions have to say about that. Perhaps try to see if there is anything besides ethics or acting morally um, that is at the core of these views. From a philosophical point of view, so I'm looking at things from a very uh, detached point of view, so I'm, I'm, one thing that um, I find very interesting is that many people seem to take issue with um, the postulation of an entity, let's call it entity like God, on the one hand, precisely because that entity has, well, is so non-standard, it's so different from the kinds of entities that are around us everywhere, doesn't have, uh, that entity doesn't have any causal properties, for example, no spatio-temporal extension, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so many people feel reluctant to even posit such an entity, but on the other hand, in other areas of philosophy, we do deal with these kinds of entities all the time. Mathematical realism is the idea that um, mathematical entities do exist, um, not in a spatio-temporal way like chairs and beer mugs, but they do exist, and what mathematical language does is it describes the mathematical cosmos. So, And I'd say people take a lot, and of course this is um, the object of a very lively ongoing philosophical debate, but in general I'd say that people take much less issue with such a position that postulates mm. the existence of mathematical objects than uh, with a position that postulates one entity um, that we call God. So I'm interested in figuring out if there is any good reason for us to be so biased about these different debates. Um, 
And my suspicion is that we're not necessarily justified in having this bias, at least from a philosophical point of view. Okay, okay. Uh, Richard Dawkins, what would the complete explanation look like? Simple things are relatively easy to understand. Complex things, by definition, are not. Therefore, what we need is an explanation of complex things in terms of simple things. Mm. And that's really my entire position. Um, we have in Darwinism a brilliant example of how you can get from primeval simplicity to ultimate, not ultimate, but very, very great complexity from the very, from the relatively easy to understand to the, to the relatively difficult to understand. And we have a cumulative, gradual, step by step bridge from the simple to the complex, from the easy to understand to the difficult to understand. We understand every step, every step of the way. Therefore, that is a model for what a complete explanation would look like. We need such an explanation for everything. We have it for life. We don't yet have it for everything. But we have it as a model for the explanation for everything. Mm. And it should give us courage. The fact that Darwin solved the biology problem should give us courage to advance to the explanation for the relatively simple world of physics. Richard Swinburne, this was the point of disagreement we went over quite a lot in the last half, so I don't want to labour it too much. But I imagine you agree with pretty much everything Richard Dawkins has said there, but you disagree on whether the God hypothesis is a complex one or a simple one. Uh, yes, and well, I disagree about whether the laws of physics uh, right. uh, plus, the, plus the universe on which they operate is a simple thing because it consists of a very large number of things. Mm. Um, uh, for the reasons I talked about, that's not a simple starting point. Um, just to answer the uh, point from over there, um, this, I'm not giving an explanation necessarily of the beginning of the universe. It might not, it might or might not have a beginning. I'm looking for an explanation of what, of what keeps it in being all the time, whether that's an eternal or, or everlasting or, or not. Um, and I certainly am looking for a causal explanation, uh, but I think that um, explanation of human behavior is also a causal explanation. We explain what somebody does in virtue of their purposes, desires, etc., and their powers. Um, we, have, uh, we have fairly limited powers, and most of us have rather similar powers to each other, but some people don't have nearly as much powers as other people do. So uh, people, um, things can differ in that respect. So uh, simplicity is a matter of postulating few entities, only one, uh, simple powers and <laughs> omni powers are simple powers because they're powers with zero and zero is a simple, uh, zero limits and it's a simple one. We're li looking for uh, everlasting uh, e an entity because that's an entity to whose uh, existence there are zero limits and we're looking for an entity from uh, of which we can postulate very few properties from which all the others follow and all and which we would expect to bring about this sort of universe so uh, it's not possible to have a scientific explanation which is very simple simply because it consists of explaining in terms of laws and laws involve a lot of things doing the same thing and that's just not a simple starting point but I've said that before of course. Jessica do you want to answer your own question that you posed what would the complete mm. explanation look like? The mystery of existence is our title, and it makes it sound as if existence was one kind of thing. Mm. Um, but actually, we're dealing with lots of different kinds of existence, as you pointed out, right? From the existence of energy, of space-time, of physical things, of events, of numbers, of laws of nature are a different kind of existence mm -hmm. from, for instance, contingent concrete entities running around, you know, your cat. Um, so it's not that there's one thing, there are multiple forms, and some are what we might call more extraordinary relative to what we usually see around us than others. Even the laws of nature, if you roll it back, 
right? So on the, on the evolutionary model, it's not simply that evolution explains all biology. What also explains all the biological upwelling is the conditions of material beings, the range of possible emergences of different kinds of organisms, the range of possible variations and mutations within these. There are actually a whole bunch of pre-settings that make evolution possible. So it's not really such a simple explanation as it seems to be. If you roll those back and look for a physics explanation at the bottom of all of them, you get something that is going, at the very least, I think part of what your point is going to be extraordinary, right? It's got something which is of a very different character from your cat and the things that we see contingently generated. Even the laws of nature have a mysterious and extraordinary cat that there are characters that seem to naturally emerge. So that I just kind of want to pull it back to, it's not really whether you're going to get a simple or a complex answer. It's whether there's something really striking and different from all that we know at the bottom of the chain mm. that I think is most interesting. Okay. It, earlier in the discussion, Richard Dawkins, I, I asked you whether simplicity was the reason which you don't favor the God hypothesis. If, the, if it, Richard Swinburne could convince you somehow that God is a simple entity, would you be open to the idea then of postulating the existence of, of this God? Well, if he could convince me of that, but quite obviously the exact opposite of simple, and so, so the question doesn't arise. Okay, well, I'm just trying to see where, you know, ultimately where the tension is and where the rejection is there, because typically people reject Richard's God on the basis of something like the problem of evil, something like that. The problem of evil is trivial compared to that, to, the, to this. I mean, to... The problem of, of evil could be solved by just saying God is an evil God. I mean, that, that's not a, not a difficult problem. Um, natural selection is a deeply evil process. Mm. Um, nature really is red and claw, in tooth and claw. Well, um, interesting, Richard Swinburne, there's quite a few students in the audience today, and I think tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of students studying religious studies in the UK have to study your response to the problem of evil as part of their exams. So um, I think it would be really interesting to, to go into a bit here. You mentioned in your opening statement that a god of the type you believe in would give us the opportunity to choose good or evil, to be free, and that's not a luxury that God himself enjoys. And then you might think that things like, uh, like delicate topics, like people who are, are suffering with, with cancer or the genocides and wars and natural disasters. I think it'd be quite a, a difficult thing to say to somebody who's going through those, uh, those indescribably problematic events that you know, this is a great way for you to develop your character. This provides the opportunity for you to be good or, or to leave this horrible regime or this is a great challenge for you to overcome curing cancer and that seems like a a difficult pill for a lot of agnostics who would like to move towards theism to swallow would you like uh, to come you'd up? like a lecture on the problem of evil <laughs> um well I'd, li I'd like to know what you'd say to someone who yeah was, well i wouldn't come say that, that to a person suffering mm. um <laughs> this is this is um you have to just console them. Um, it would be uh, uh, they. They would. They, that's not what they want. An argument. Mm. Uh, but um, when they've got over their suffering, or when you are asking the question, when you're not suffering and standing back and wondering why mm. there is evil, then uh, there is, I believe, an answer. All right. Well, it does start from uh, human free will. God gives us, uh, makes us what I would call mini creators. He gives us a, a share in his creative work. Um, and uh, he gives us a choice, which he doesn't have, uh, of the sort of world we want to be, the sort of people we want to be, the sort of people we want our friends to be, the sort of people we want the world to be. Mm -hmm. And it will only be a real choice and matter. If, uh, if the bad choice has bad effects, um, if, if it was just a toy world where it was made little bad effects and little good effects, then people would think it wouldn't matter whether you were good or not. Mm. Um, it's got to matter a lot. And of course it does matter a lot. Um, we are in that position. 
We're going to take a quick break now, but we would love to hear your thoughts. Do drop us an email at unbelievable at premier.org.uk or you can get in touch via our social media at unbelievablefe for Twitter or facebook.com forward slash premier unbelievable. You are listening to Unbelievable teaming up with the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast. We'll be back in just a minute to hear more from these amazing guests. The mind and brain are connected, but the scientific data doesn't enable you to establish the nature of that connection or the relationship. Just because science can't demonstrate that physical processes and mental processes are the same thing, that in and of itself doesn't give you any evidence that that's not the case either. Some people talk about seeing deceased relatives and communicating with them. This idea of floating up out of your body and watching things happen and being able to describe it afterwards, that could be formed in your imaginative mind. Conscious experience and brain processes are two fundamentally different things. I wonder if we're talking about- Would you like me to go out for a bit? You guys seem really happy. (laughs) Welcome back to part two of this special Unbelievable, where we are showcasing a discussion that was recorded in London earlier this summer by the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast team. The debate gathered four incredible minds, Richard Dawkins representing science and atheism, Jessica Frazier on Hinduism, Sylvia Jonas speaking on Jewish philosophy, and Richard Swinburne defending Christianity. These four are joined by Pan Psychast host, Jack Symes. We've unpacked the, the character building and the reasons why the world's better because it contains yeah. those evils. I wonder how much evil would there have to be for you to say, now there's too much? How many people would have to, to die? Yeah, these well, I wouldn't for... wish to put a number. How can you count these things? So the... But I would make the point uh, that, although it may not seem to to the audience, a hundred years is a, a very short time. Uh, compared to an everlasting time. Mm. And um, if people suffer too much, they just die. Uh, There is clearly a limit. Um, Whether it's too big or not, it's very difficult to decide. I don't think it is too big. But once you get the idea that it's somewhere along this line, it's a good thing, and too much would be, Mm. then it becomes just a matter of degree. But of course, the... uh, there are evils which are not produced by humans, mm. natural evils, um, disease, accident, etc., etc. Um, and these two give choices, Jewish choices to us how to deal with it. Are we going to keep all the food to ourselves or are we going to share it? Um, are we going to feel sorry for ourselves or are we going to try and cheer other people up? There are always choices for the sufferer as well as for the malevolent person or a person who might be malevolent. Can I just interject here with one thing? So you say that there's eternal happiness of heaven, of everlasting unity with God. It's nothing compared to finite suffering here in the world. But for for a lot of Christians, there is a place of this everlasting, infinite pain and suffering, isn't there? So it, doesn't it not balance out on uh, that? Well, I don't think that, uh, that uh, you're, what you're saying is that I, I think that uh, um, a lot of people suffer in hell. I don't think anyone suffers in hell except through their own choice. That is to say, one of the most anti- the worst condition of humans can be to be full of hatred. Mm. And uh, um, if they continually reject the good, I don't mean they, they reject the, the tenets of Christian belief, I, I mean they, they reject all the good right. uh, they see and out for selfishness and are quite happy to exterminate people and torture people. Mm. And they've lost their sense of the goodness. And God is, they wouldn't be happy in heaven. They wouldn't want to be in heaven. Uh, uh, but uh, um, heaven is for people who love the good and want the good, and most of us are not fitted for heaven, even at the end of our lives. And indeed, both uh, uh, Catholic and Chris- uh, Orthodox Christianity allow for that possibility that we will end our lives without our fate being heaven or hell. On the Catholic view, as it were, uh, <laughs> the only alternative is purgatory, and in the end we'll get to heaven if we're right. put in purgatory. 
the Orthodox allow the possibility that we might go either way before, before the um, uh, general uh, resurrection. Uh, that is to say, our fate might not be determined to death. We might have to show ourselves one way or the other eventually. Um, just to open the discussion up here, Sylvia, do you want to interject on, on this point? Sorry, I, I just... I would like to ask a question. Um, actually, it's a question, uh, a question for Richard Dawkins, um, but um, inspired by what you just said. So, mm. and and it sort of, uh, I think, illustrates my point of view. There is so much beauty in what you just said, and I can so much beauty. so much beauty in what you just said, and it gives a certain uh, perspective on our otherwise completely random existence. Um, and it gives people dignity. So it, I was just reminded of um, uh, the novel by Henrik Sienkiewicz, uh, Quo Vadis. It was turned into a, a, a popular Hollywood, Hollywood movie, but I'm talking about the actual novel that he received the Nobel Prize for. And it mm. describes the persecution of Christians um, under the rule of Nero mm -hmm. in uh, ancient Rome. So early Christianity. And it was so atrocious um, what they did to Christian people back in the days. And their belief, their faith, gave them such dignity when they had to face the most horrible, horrible things that were being done to them. And I found that extremely moving. I found I've, it's, it's impossible to ignore the kinds of power that a religion and a religious belief can unfold. And it's something I think, as a philosopher at least, I want to respect. And that's something that belongs onto the syllabus of every good philosophy undergraduate course. My question for you, Richard Dawkins, is on your worldview, what do you make of the belief of so many people in the world who are theists or have theistic inclinations? Um, I'd say it's, uh, we spoke about the numbers, uh, or I mentioned them in the book, mm. I think it's at least 95% or some number like that. 7% of the world are non-religious. That's right, 7% yeah. um, of the world's population, I don't self-identify as atheists. Mm. So the vast majority of people have at least some kind of theistic inclinations, whatever exactly the, uh, whatever exact form they might be taking. Are all of these people only deluded? Is that, is that the only thing we can say about that? Yes. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> I mean, what, what argument are you making? Um, mm. we, don't, we don't decide such things by majority vote. Mm. No, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that besides offering an explanatory competing hypothesis to questions about the first instances of our cosmos or perhaps about whatever sustains the cosmos. Religion and theistic belief does so much more. Mm. And I think there, is, uh, there should be a place uh, in any philosophy thinking about this that respects all the different functions and benefits that theistic belief has. What, 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 more, what more are you thinking of? What, what do you say does so much more? What are you thinking of there? Sorry? What are you thinking of when you say re religious belief does so much more? Well, it gives, it makes sense of, as I said, it gives a sense to something that is otherwise completely unexplainable. Um, when we look at the ethical dimensions of religious belief, it can give people guidance, how to behave, how to act with one another. It can give uh, answers how to, as Richard Swinburne just explained to us, it can give us a way of facing, um, well, extremely difficult life situations. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It gives comfort and consolation. Somehow, it sounds a little bit like. Well, it's to me. I it, I feel like it's a little bit more than that. When you say it like that, I assume what you have in mind is that um, it comforts us the way uh, wishful thinking sometimes comforts yes. us. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what yeah. do you make of the fact that? There are people who are extremely educated, who have read your books, um, who know their way around in the natural sciences, and yet hold on to theistic beliefs. Well, um, many of them, if you actually ask them what they believe, it turns out that they are what they might call spiritual. 
Um, what, what's the difference? Well, um, I'm spiritual. When I when I look up at the stars, when I look up at the Milky Way, I have a feeling, an overwhelming emotional reaction to that, and you could call that spiritual. So when you say that highly educated people in science are religious, you want to ask them: Do they actually believe, for example, that Jesus is the Son of God? Do they actually believe they're going to survive their own death? I would ask them that sort of question. Do you think that the people you're talking about believe they're going to survive death? Yes, I think I cannot speak so much for um, the Christian point of view, but I know of quite a few people who are scientists and who are observant Jews and who believe that the halacha, the Jewish uh, law, is literally true. Yes, but do they believe they're going to survive death? Well, that's... It's it's a question. That's a that big is, question. It's a question because that is, have, doesn't have the same prominent place in Judaism. I know as it, it doesn't. Has in that's why I asked it. Um, the, I, I, I asked it precisely because that is a scientific question. The brain is what does the thinking. When the brain decays, do they? Do you think you're going to survive death? Do they mm -hmm. think? They, do you think you're going to survive death? I don't know. I, I wish I had such a firm answer to it. Well, but well, I certainly don't think that. Um, I should dismiss somebody who believes it for good reasons. Good reasons meaning, you know, a certain upbringing, a certain conviction that their religious tradition has a point should just be disqualified as people who are doing are engaged in wishful thinking. Just to interject here to bring Jessica in for a moment. Just a point of agreement, though. I, I think Richard Dawkins is fine, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, with those mm -hmm. who are culturally Christian who enjoy collective... Um, comings together and community building and the artworks and all the, there are some good things that come out of religious community, which I think you'll both agree give people a sense of purpose and um, togetherness, strength, etc. And, and beautiful, wonderful art as well. The point of the disagreement though is that it's just wishful thinking in terms of the scientific hypothesis that God yes, I mean the, 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 the music and the art we're we're mm. definitely agreed about. Yeah, um, and and there's no question about that. The the beautiful literature, the 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 the, the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the Song of Songs. These are wonderful poetry. As I gather, they're even better in the Hebrew than in the English, but they're pretty good in English. But so what? I mean that that has nothing to do with the truth right. of propositions, which is a scientific proposition that when the brain decays, your personality your survives. That is a scientific proposition, which uh, seems to me at least very, very improbable indeed. So we just have a few minutes until we open the floor to audience questions. So I just want to make sure Jessica is able to jump in on some of these points before we do so. Uh, just briefly on it. I mean, uh, just on that particular point, even before uh, this Richard made the point about wishful thinking, that argument in the modern world originates with Sigmund Freud in The Future of an Illusion, who says... Wishful thinking doesn't make a thing true. It doesn't mean it's not true either, but it doesn't intrinsically make a no, thing no, true, no, right? True. So it's yeah. so it's it's a it's a well established kind of point. Um, just to note, maybe of that ninety, what is it, ninety three percent of the world's mm. people who are considered religious, I don't think they're all considered theists. I think a lot of those people would be, for instance, in China. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them will be in India. Some of those will be, some will not, right? So there's a, a huge number will be Buddhists. Uh, there are a huge number who would say to the problem of evil. We were never promised. The idea that we're promised a world where everything's going to be perfect all the time is actually quite an odd presupposition. It's not that everybody automatically lives with that as the thing. And the idea then that we're kind of resentful if everything isn't perfect. Oh, dear, it's a bad world. Uh, there's a long uh, precedent, both in Western and in Asian religion, that what makes life meaningful isn't whether it's nice all the time. Yeah. Right? It's whether it has an intrinsic value. And the idea that if you make time and space and agents and agencies who have to go through things and deal and experience, you're always going to have a mix of the good and bad. You don't get to preload that with a happy, a sort of a rosy glow. So it, it, it may be that being itself is what makes it good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, either you affirm that there exists these things or you do not. If you do, you have to take what comes. Uh, but the problem of evil is a very particular problem within a particular set, as it were. Okay, wonderful. That seems like a nice natural place to open the floor to audience questions. I think we've got a couple of people with microphones dotted around the theatre. I can spot one up there. Do just raise your hand. If it's towards a particular one of our panellists, then please 
make sure you identify them at the start of your question. Try and keep your questions brief and keep them as questions rather than comments if possible so we can ask as many as we can. I think the first hand that was just over there, I can't quite spot you. I think you're wearing... Hi, uh, yeah, I'm wearing black. Hi. You're wearing black. Yeah, uh, that's why. Hi, everyone. I, I feel humbled to even speak to you. Uh, Professor Dawkins, recently in a podcast, I heard you say, uh, if you were to believe in a God, the fine-tune universe argument would be a reason. Now, we believe in a multiverse, and, and um, it, uh, you said a multiverse means there are many universes. No, not many. There's got to be an infinite number of universes to explain the fine-tuned nature of our own universe. So, and we as a species will never be able to reach beyond the veils of our own universe. Science tells us we will never know the answer as to whether there is a multiverse or not. But why is it, um, uh, uh, why can scientists not contemplate trying to balance the probabilities of there possibly being a creator as opposed to uh, the, the possibility of being a multiverse because both seem very, very improbable and both need an extreme degree of complexity. Probably the same degree of complexity because we're talking about infinite universes as well as an infinite nature of God. The um, multiverse theory is not just proposed ad hoc to answer the question of the fine-tuning. The multiverse theory follows from the inflation theory, which is, which is well-supported. Uh, and so um, it, that, I think that, that's an important point to make, that physicists have other reasons mm. for accepting a multiverse uh, theory. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not a physicist, so I, I can't speak with too much authority, but that's what I understand. Um, and... Uh, when I said that if I were to believe in a god, it would be because of the fine-tuning argument, that I, I'm vulnerable to being misunderstood. When I've said things like that before, uh, theists have jumped on and said, aha, Dawkins <laughs> is a theist after all. Um, and uh, that's not what I want to... It really is a very big if. Mm. Um, okay, fantastic. I think we've got another question just up here. Uh, I have a question for Richard Swinburne. Uh, Where are you? Up here. <laughs> up here. I think he's wearing black yes. as well. It's wearing black like as well. <laughs> the yes. light rather obscures it, you yeah. see in the audience. So the, the, the question is, you mentioned at, at the start and also later about uh, free will and choice. Yeah. Um, can you explain if uh, choice or real choice is compatible with the choice being determined by your mental states, so your your values, your character, your goals, etc. Uh, so, is it compatible with being fixed as a result of those mental states, um, or is it uh, completely undetermined? Uh, we are, of course, influenced by various things, uh, influenced by our upbringing, influenced by our peers, etc., etc. Um, uh, but my claim about free will is that it's only an influence. We can resist uh, if we try, and we only have a limited amount of free will, uh, limited to the alternatives which we uh, are aware of, and just how difficult it is for us to take one of them. But within a small area, I think we do have a free will uh, to resist uh, these influences. And every time we take a good choice, it's e of some sort, it's easier to take a good choice of that kind next time, and conversely, of course. And in that way, we can form our character. Um, so that is my answer to that. Okay, we think we've got a question just up here. If you could just raise your hand slightly. On the topic of the God hypothesis, something Sylvia touched Sorry, on... Sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> something that Sylvia touched on before the interval was the idea that we should just accept that God is omnipotent and leave it at that, which is bringing up how we maybe can't comprehend God at all in human terms, since he isn't human, he's beyond that. So how can we understand his design for humans or his intentions if we can't understand him in the first place because we don't even have the language to do so? So the, the question is... 
We, know, we think that God's omnipotent. We say that God's omnipotent. How can we begin to grasp this idea from our limited human minds? Does that capture the, the spirit of yeah. the question? Sylvia, would you like to begin on this? Because I think you asked Richard Swinburne this earlier in our discussion, and then perhaps Richard Swinburne can comment on it afterwards. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the question. It's, um, it is a very difficult question, and uh, it, it just so happens that one of the most important Jewish philosophers in the history of uh, Jewish philosophy, Maimonides, he uh, thought about it a lot in the Guide for the Perplexed. And his idea is that, um, well, God is really entirely indescribable. Um, the properties we use to describe the, the, the physical world that we see around us or people we meet um, are not applicable to God at all. God is entirely other. Um, and the only way we can say anything about God is by means of negation. We can say God is not this, God is not that, God is not uh, physical, God is not whatever. So um, that's the only way we can sort of get a little bit closer using language to what God is like. But Maimonides also says that um, conventionally, of course, we do talk about God. Um, so for example, Maimonides would say probably about uh, this way of talking about God as omniscient and omnipotent and omnibenevolent or whatever is um, is to be understood as a sort of metaphorical way of speaking about God that can help some people, the slightly less educated ones, less educated in the sense of uh, in, in, in religious matters, to form an idea of God that will help them um, become better, well, religious practitioners or to help people follow the religious rules. But really the idea is that nothing can really be said about God. And I think that's actually a very important question. I mean, we might or might not be satisfied with what Maimonides has to say about that. Um, but it is an interesting question, given that we're talking about this non, as I called it, God as a non-standard entity, um, to what extent the properties that we're used to um, from our normal language actually apply mm. to God? Like, what does it even mean to use these properties? Yeah. As the audience could probably tell, Sylvia does have a book exploring these ideas in <laughs> oh, great detail. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, Richard Swinburne, do you want to uh, comment yes, on this? Yes, of course, question? and Aquinas read that, but Aquinas disagreed with that point, saying that we could, uh, we could uh, use words analogically of God, saying that he was like us in this sort of respect, but very much more so, and mm. so on. That is to say, we, we apply the uh, concepts of good or powerful, um, rightly to God, but God had them eminentiori modo in a more eminent way, and that, that's the way we answer. But that, that indeed is, is the answer to, to, to your question. We have these concepts of goodness, power, um, and so on, and we are rightly attributing them to God but we are attributing them in an infinite degree so that, or rather, yes, so that he is very, not merely very powerful, but all powerful, not merely very good, but all good. And um, we can grasp that um, because we can see people who differ from each other in goodness and we would say, well, God is even more good than they are. Mm -hmm. And we uh, can see people who differ in power, but he is all more powerful than they are. Um, and I say that that is right at the beginning of the, the book of Genesis that he made us in his image after his likeness and our terms applicable to us are applicable to God stretched in this way. Um, and of course exactly the same problem arises with physics. That is to say, physics is postulating some quite extraordinary entities which are partly waves and partly particles. We don't meet these around us, not visibly. We have to be told they're there and we have to believe it because it makes good predictions and it's simple theory, relatively speaking. Um, and... Um, we have to use words in stretched senses to describe the 
micro world, and we have to use them in set stretch senses to describe the macro world. Mm. But we can do it because we do know what it is to be good, we do have a concept of morality, and we do know what power is. Okay, I think we're going to go to another question here. So my question is for uh, Richard uh, Swinburne, m- primarily. Um, before I ask it, I just wanted to quickly like rattle off something that I believe you think, and I just wanted to make sure that I'm right about this. So uh, that humans have free will, that God has a special interest in us, um, and I forgot my third one, but that'll do. Um, just wanted to make sure that you're on the same board. Oh, there's the, believe in the science. That was it. You believe in the science as much and, and the evolution and that sort of thing. You're, you're on board with all those three? I'm on board. Uh, that God exists, that we have free will, and that you accept the findings of modern science. Yes, yes, yes. All and three. that God has a special interest in us, humans. I mean, yes, God yes, sure. So my question would be, you sort of mentioned earlier that there's this God having kind of like a parent to a child and teaching us, and that's why free will is important and such. Um, I understand it's difficult to speculate on the motives of a God and such, but I'm interested in asking why would God, who has um, infinite power and could have made the universe in any such way and fine-tuned it to be in any speed, why would he choose a method to create a universe that needed 14 billion years before human beings could ever come around, his Mm. special interest? Well, I made the remark that uh, it was probable that he would make us, but it was quite probable he would make other things. And uh, let's just consider the world for the first uh, uh, ten of those billion years when there was no living creatures. It's rather like the sort of, only on a very much larger scale, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, ceremony, that uh, the big fireworks ceremony that uh, World Cups start with or Olympic Games start with. It's a marvellous dance, uh, the universe, of clashing galaxies and uh, uh, exploding stars and so mm. on. It's a big fireworks display and it's a big work of art. Of course he's interested in it. But he's also interested in animals when you get to that stage. And, um, uh, or rather, uh, uh, the process of natural selection, until you get to conscious animals, and I'll I'll come to those in a moment, um, uh, it's a wonderful process. It's a process of producing more and more, as you say, uh, powerful, complicated organisms uh, out of simple starts. And one day, uh, a very clever scientist is going to invent a machine uh, that can use the parts of old machines. It will get hold of the old old machines, and it will rearrange them into new machines, and it will all be done by machine. But God has (laughs) arranged it, has played that game in advance. Uh, It's a marvelous thing, natural selection. Uh, But in the course of time, of course, it throws up animals who are conscious, and I don't myself think that consciousness uh, starts anywhere before the mammals. I may be wrong about this, but um, they, they, things before that um, don't have brains of, of the kind that have uh, uh, the correlates of consciousness. At that point, of course, there is a problem of animal suffering, and I hadn't mentioned that before, mm. and clearly the free will solution will not uh, avail for that, because I don't think uh, animals have free will. On the other hand, I don't think they suffer nearly as much as we do. Uh, I mean, if we suffer a lot and uh, invertebrates don't suffer at all, one would expect it to be gradual. And I have reasons for expecting it to be gradual, um, uh, of of the kind that I suspect Richard knows more about than I do, but um, uh, it's a a matter of... um, you, you can't judge consciousness, me- whether they're conscious, merely by them making a certain sorts of reactions mm. because um, uh, it's fairly well agreed that when uh, 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 you suffer some pain or you, know, some, uh, you stick a pin in you or something, uh, there are two nerve uh, um, circuits produced by that, one producing your reaction and the other producing your feeling. Mm. And you can have one without the other or conversely. So it's no good arguing that fish are conscious because they react <laughs> in certain ways. They can have the reaction without, without the, the feeling, firstly. But upwards from um, 
the mammals, there are clearly correlates in their brain, uh, similar to the uh, brain structures which produce pain in us. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're very much smaller brains. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a vast generalization, and we could go into the mm -hmm. details. Uh, but that is a good reason to suppose that the suffering is correspondingly less. And if that is the case, then of course there is a reason why uh, uh, animals um, the, uh, would suffer because it gives, although they don't um, do it freely, it gives meaning and purpose to their lives. If you shut them in a zoo and just feed them every day, they've no, got no meaning and purpose. But if you let them in the wild where they, they may catch predators and they may be caught by predators and um, they can try and save themselves, save their kin, save their offspring. They've got a purpose in life, and the purpose in life is made possible by their being suffering, which they're trying to avoid, mm -hmm. and suffering and getting food and all that sort of thing. It, the suffering goes with the animals having a purpose. Now, if the suffering was as great as ours, then I don't think that would be a good enough explanation, but I don't think it is. Right, but sorry, just I don't want to ask. A, I do want to ask about. I am, but I'm going to ask for your answer as quickly as possible because I want to make sure we've got some of the questions floating around. If it turned out that all of the chickens, the cows, the pigs, the fish, who are living in these horrific conditions in the factory farming industry or something like this, did feel pain, then it seems like a massive amount of pain is put on the. The scales against the God hypothesis, right? Oh, no, no, because if, if it's humans' fault, then uh, uh, that's quite different. That, that's caused by our evil. We, we, are, we are doing it to them. Uh, mm. Nothing, such a new, new thing enters the scale. I was considering the animals before we are humans. Just let Richard talk yes, to them. Can I just say question. something about, about um, animal suffering? Mm. Um, Richard Swinburne, of course, is quite right that you can't tell whether animals are conscious just by looking at their, their behavior. Um, and he's also right that, um, that there's a difference between the, the, when you stick the pin in the, the response and the, um, and the, and the pain. And when you ask the question, what is pain for? Pain is a warning to the animal. Mm. It's saying, don't do that again. Whatever you've just done has caused you pain. That's a warning. Next time you do that, it may kill you. That's what pain's for. So when you say that because animals have small brains, um, they are less likely to, hold, to, to feel pain, that could be the exact opposite of the truth. Uh, since the, it is a warning, don't do that again, mm. the cleverer an animal is, the less pain it should need in order to put it off doing the act again. Right. So it could be that um, although m mice have smaller brains than us, um, it could be that actually they, could, they feel more pain. We shall never know, but at least mm. that's an, a counter-argument. I don't think that's anything to do with the chap's question anyway. I know, we've moved it <laughs> quite far away. We're going to take a quick break now, but we would love to hear your thoughts. Do drop us an email at unbelievable at premier.org.uk or you can get in touch via our social media at unbelievablefe for Twitter or facebook.com forward slash premier unbelievable. You are listening to Unbelievable, teaming up with the pan Psychast Philosophy podcast. We'll be back in just a minute to hear more from these amazing guests. You would call yourself an atheist? I would, yes. I would call myself a Christian humanist. One of the big themes over the history of what we now think of as science has been questioning the exceptionalism of humankind. I think the critical thing is what gives something value. Would you say that minds construct meaning or detect meaning? I have had made from a little piece of my arm something that could reasonably be called a second brain. I think one of the real challenges that evolution by natural selection puts to Christian belief is the idea that Welcome back to this special Unbelievable, where we're showcasing a discussion that was recorded in London earlier this summer by the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast team. 
The debate, which we've split into two parts, gathered four incredible minds. Richard Dawkins, representing science and atheism, Jessica Frazier on Hinduism, Sylvia Jonas speaking on Jewish philosophy, and Richard Swinburne defending Christianity. The four of these guys are being moderated by pan psychast host, Jack Symes. Let's jump to the question over here. Is there an implication that consciousness in some form exists intrinsically within the trillions of particles that precedes the emergence of higher forms of life, as we understand it? If this is not the implication, I have a follow-up question. In discussing the question of why is there something instead of nothing, we seem to inherently pose a question of purpose rather than function and causality, which to me seems a product of our own conscious narrative-driven cognition. And for me, it is hard to grapple with the idea that the atoms that make a celestial body racing throughout space are acting purposefully. If we consider that these questions of purpose and existence may stem from the nature and limitation of our human consciousness, how do we, how do we re reconcile this with the concept of God? Specifically, how can the phenomenon of God exist outside the realm of human interpretation and understanding? Thank you. Okay, so there's a few things flowing through that question, aren't there? The, the, first, <laughs> the first thing I struggle to understand, I'll just say it back to you to see, you, you asked whether there's billions of, or I'm not sure what language you use, of particles that were conscious that constituted God, and whether that makes sense, or was it that well, fundamental question, reality is it's well, made of consciousness? Question is the, question, mm. the question of why there is something instead of nothing, rather than how there is something instead of nothing. The question of why itself is a question of purpose, which seems, which seems not right. to exist outside the realm of human cognition, given that we are narrative-driven. Mm. That's, that's my question. So how, how can we... How can we reconcile that with God? How can God exist outside of human cognition? Does God exist outside of human cognition? Okay, good. Jessica, do you want to take care of this one? Uh, yeah, I get your point. Like, why is there something rather than nothing? Sounds like a, what purpose is there, mm. right? And that's central to what we call like the design argument, the teleological argument, and it gets made again and again. Uh, that there, there could have been nothing. There's something. There must be a reason. Someone must have wanted it that way. Just to note that that's a kind of a theistic presupposition already. I think actually what most of us are talking about is more the like, what is the cause? function process that led there to be something, rather than what is the purpose that the world is serving. That is part of what Richard's saying, but I don't think that's what he means when he, when you, like if you use the classical arguments from natural theology, the cosmological, the ontological, the design arguments, they're not asking what the purpose is. They're saying, why would there, why did this come to be rather than not be, mm. which is a different argument. So I, I'm just noting that I think we're not necessarily saying uh, that it's a purpose has to be a purpose-driven thing, yeah. right? And no, not we're not automatically arguing that it's coming to be because somebody had a good reason to want the world to be there. We're rather saying, what is the process that led to it? If you do want to look at it in terms of a purpose, uh, yeah, agreed. Then there's part of what you're then asking is, what kind of purposes do we see the world as maybe fulfilling, right? But that's a different why. That's a value why, a teleological, use-driven why, rather than a what process has led to it. I'm not sure we are asking that or positing that kind of why. That's and our an answer to those questions are something like the why God chose to create the world. Well, there was always something. There was never nothing. I, God always existed. The reason mm -hmm. why God created the world was ultimately union with God and this sort of well, thing. Well, yeah, as I said, um, a major reason, the major reason, is because we are good things, and he created it for us, but we're not the only good things. Uh, animals are good things, and uh, maybe all sorts of uh, uh, creatures exist in other, other universes <laughs> or other galaxies, I, I wouldn't know. But um, one purpose is clearly for us, and we are a good thing. Mm. And um, the four features of the universe which I drew attention to, the physical universe governed by simple laws of nature leading to our evolution of us and that we being conscious are necessary for our existence and mm. that's why it's like that. I was going to go around a, a little oh, bit here, but I'm aware that there's a, a few other questions dotted around. I want to get to as many as we can. Yeah. Okay, this is a question for Richard Swinburne. Um, why should it all be about us? Why should God care only for human beings? When you think of the incredible enormity of the universe, what other life is out there, if there is a God, why should it all be about human beings? Isn't that rather speciesist? 
Given also that our existence is only a fraction of the history of the Earth, how old this planet is, that right. it's all about us. And I find, if anything, rather, if there is a God, rather insulting. It's like, that, is God really that petty? Why should it just be about humans? Uh, I said that was a major purpose of God's uh, creative activity, but I didn't say it was the only one. Indeed, I emphasize that there are other good things. Um, uh, we can only form our judgments on the basis of what we know, and there may be all sorts of other reasons he has, and there may be all sorts of other creatures in the universe. Uh, but confining ourselves to the things we know about, we are a uniquely good thing in, in uh, <laughs> the universe that we know about because we, to all appearances actually, have free will and we can choose between good and evil and animals don't have that. Uh, they, they don't have the concept of moral goodness. They are, of course, altruistic. That is to say, uh, they, they show affection for their offspring and kin and so on. But that's not the same as moral goodness. Moral goodness is um, trying to produce a good state that you don't want to produce, that you don't like and you don't desire. It's, it's producing something contrary to your worst instincts, and I don't think animals are like that. If they are, then of course yeah. <laughs> they are uh, uh, humanoid enough for, for God's purpose just in creating them to be the same as mm -hmm. purpose in creating us. But given they're not like this, we are a superior sort of being. And if this is species, is well, it's just true. <laughs> Let's have the question from the gentleman in the white knight T-shirt over there in the centre, and then we're going to go to the back of the room to the gentleman in blue straight after that. Um, seeing as the conversation in the latter half veered towards this idea of um, religion as something comforting and wishful thinking, in relation to you know things like death and afterlife, um, do you think perhaps that atheism and this scientific view that there is nothingness in death and death is the complete end, do you think that instead provides more comfort than... Um, something like an eternal torment. Mm. Is, is the afterlife, or the lack of an afterlife for the atheist, more desirable than the traditional idea of heaven and hell, I think is the question. Does anyone like to take a, a go at this one? It sounds like a question. <laughs> a small question for... for yeah, I like. think you should be careful of the uh, description either of heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. I don't think most of us would be very happy in heaven because uh, heaven is for those who really like the worship of God and helping him in his work and like it so much that they, they want to do it forever. Most of us in heaven would find ourselves, well, that's all right for some time, but uh, uh, wouldn't it be nice to uh, indulge our own uh, other sorts of desires? We're not altogether fitted for heaven. And, uh, and uh, I don't think hell is, is a place of literal torment. I, I think it's a horrible, if there is such a place, I think it's a horrible place, but it's for those who have chosen it who simply don't want to go to heaven and want to uh, indulge their, their selfish desires, and they want to be there. So um, God gives people what they want to give, what they want. Anyone else want to come in well, on this? Whether it's comforting or not, of course, has no bearing on whether it's true, no, no, which is what right I care so, about. Right so. um, as for whether it's comforting, um, I think uh, the idea of eternity is rather frightening, mm -hmm. and I would rather like to spend eternity under a general anaesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will. A question at the back of the room here. What I'd like to know is, what is the aim of an atheist? What is the purpose in their life, and what is their end aim, what they wish to achieve? Thank you. Well, atheism is not a religion, it's not a faith. Um, it's just a lot of individual people who don't believe in the supernatural. And so each individual makes their own uh, purpose. Um, by the way, I think purpose is a nonsensical concept and that until late in the universe when beings with brains, or equivalent of brains, come into being capable of having purposes. To talk about purpose of 
of, at the beginning of of the co of the cos cosmologies, it seems to me to be a nonsensical thing. There is no purpose. It's a non it's a non question. Um, but as I said, we can make our own purposes. Um, some of us make our purpose in studying science, and that's a pretty worthwhile one. Uh, the purpose of understanding why you exist, which is what science is about, understanding why the universe exists, um, why life exists, why, why are we here, that, those are all scientific questions, and it's a very, very worthwhile way of spending your decades in the sun to understand how you came to be there. Other people find their own purpose in human relations, in, as I do, in, in all the various pastimes that we have as, as humans. But I don't think it would be right to say that atheism itself mm. is a kind of cult that should therefore have a unified purpose. Uh, a question from the gentleman in the blazer in the, right in the center, if you can reach him there. Lucy, you might have to pass the microphone down to reach him there. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk, but it, to me, the striking aspect was the way in which it gravitated back to the existence or non-existence of a probably non-existent entity. And I found that rather sucked the life out of examining the mystery of existence. And I do recognize the sympathy which we must accord the religious and its traditions in order not to be um, unduly cruel. But if the entire debate then revolves around that binary does it or doesn't it, then I don't think we grapple with the, um, the difficulty that if we accept, as I think I probably do, um, uh, Richard Dawkins' point of view that, you know, really we can't know beyond what we know, then we're not really constructing a meaning of existence in which religion has had a, a part to play in. And I think this sort of conversation could be so much more fruitful if it was not hijacked by God, who in that way demonstrates a degree of omnipotence. And I particularly um, be interested in Jessica's thoughts on that. Uh, Jessica, if we suck the life out of the mystery of existence, <laughs> the exact kind of question you want after uh, the two hours of discussing it. <laughs> Have we managed to suck the life out of what should be a very interesting <laughs> philosophical question? Um, I mean, of course, about the word religious, right? If anyone wants to go do a religious studies degree, come and see us. Like, you'll be studying atheism and Buddhism. You'll be studying a whole range of... So religious, again, is not theism, just to put that out there. Um, and if anyone's tired of that fight, is part of kind of what's implied here, then do go and look at other mm. cultures, of which that is the majority of human history. Um, but yeah, essentially, I think I agree that the, the, the theism, uh, scientific materialism fight can go on and on and on and on and on. And it's a very odd formation. And I think the kind of reasons that theism believes certain of its ideas are not ones that are necessarily going to be accessible to this kind of debate. There are particular reasons often rooted in personal belief, etc. Um, there is a wider study of the mystery of existence. There's a wider glorious <laughs> human history long project of exploring that through science, through physics, through metaphysics, through philosophy, and through spiritual perspectives as well. That is there, and we seem to have turned away from it. Right, reductionism is a strange thing. It can say only one part of the mystery of existence matters, the atoms, or the blah, 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 the this. Whereas actually there's a huge range of things going on. It would be so nice if the modern age stopped fighting and decided to engage in the ongoing exploration, mm. understanding, and maybe contribution to this strange thing going on called existence, which has incredibly deep roots in something extraordinary, whatever it is extraordinary emergent heights of becoming and generating new realities, which is running through us at this very moment, whatever being is. This is, this is exciting. Surely this is more exciting than having fights about that other particular thing. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to end on this point. Well, that is all we've got time for today. We do hope that you enjoyed the concluding part of that debate, courtesy of the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast team. 
As always, we would love to know what you think of the show. Do get in touch at premierunbelievable.com. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Thank you.